Sinai is calling. This time tomorrow, we will rise to our feet when the Ten Commandments are chanted. We will stand at the base of the mountain and receive Torah anew. The sound of Dr. Naim Dalal's voice, the trope that he learned as a boy in Baghdad, the trope that he has now taught to his grandchildren, including our comfort Lindsay, it is a tribal sound that beckons us to plant our feet at Sinai once again, to reaffirm the covenant between God and the Jewish people. We will witness the thunder and the lightning. We will smell the smoke. We will take an awestruck step back and solemnly pledge two words, Na'aseh v'nishma. We will do and we will listen. According to these words, it is true in every age. We must do, and through those actions we will come to understand. The early rabbis ask a fair question, which I bet our confirmation students and our bat mitzvah, Alexis, also ask. That promise that was made at Mount Sinai, about it we can ask, how could our ancestors obligate us? Don't we have to choose Torah for ourselves? It's an important question of contract law. Can parents legally bind their children? Can we inherit a promise? Are we duty-bound to uphold a contract struck by the previous generation? Listen to the text itself. In Parashat Nitzavim, it is written, Atem Nitzavim Hayom Kulchem. You stand this day, all of you, before Adonai your God, your leaders, your elders, your officials, the men of Israel, your children, your wives, even the stranger within your camp, from the woodchopper to the water drawer, to enter into the covenant which God is making with you today. I make this covenant not with you alone, God says, but both with those who are standing here this day, as well as those who are not standing with us here today. Teenagers are right when they ask, how can my parents obligate me to do anything? How much more so when the parents that we're talking about lived more than 3,000 years ago? How could they sign their names on the dotted line at Sinai and contractually obligate us? How could they sign our names on that dotted line, so to speak? The rabbis answer this good question in at least three ways. First, the first possibility. Yes, legally, children can be strapped to their parents' obligations. Debts can be transferred through inheritance. And think of the debt that is owed to God who rescued us from Egypt. Our ancestors at Sinai knew Egyptian slavery, and because they were liberated, they were indebted to God, and therefore owed God's servitude through the mitzvot. And so we inherit that indebtedness. Moreover, our parents can and do make decisions for us all the time. With our best interest in mind, of course, they determine which city we'll be born in and raised in, what neighborhood and therefore what school friends we are likely to make. They also take responsibility for our health, what food we will eat, what doctors we will see. The choices our parents make for us, not to mention the DNA that many are likely to inherit from their parents, these shape a great part of who we are and who we will become. Independence from our parents, and our teenagers have a growing independence, that is healthy and important. But no one is completely independent from parents. A spiritual inheritance is also for parents to provide for their children and grandchildren. So answer number one is yes, they can obligate us, and they do. The second answer 
to the good question is no, our parents cannot obligate us. Because we are individuals capable of choosing for ourselves, and individuals can and woe upon us sometimes do opt out of the covenant. But we are faithful in the Jewish people as a whole, because while individuals might opt out, the collective will endure. The Jewish people as a totality will endure for all time. And the third possibility, which comes from our rabbis, requires some imagination of the spirit. It is taught that we were, in fact, all there. That each of us signed our name on the dotted line. When it is written, Atem nitzavim hayom kulchem, you stand this day, all of you, before Adonai your God, it means that we were there. One generation was physically standing at Sinai, but every Jewish soul of every future generation was there in spirit. And that includes, the rabbis say, all the souls of any Jew who would one day convert into Judaism. Their souls were also there to witness the giving and the receiving of Torah. This is what is meant when God says, I make this covenant both with those of you who are standing here this day with us and those who are not yet here with us this day. No one answered for us according to this possible answer. We were there. We answered for ourselves. Na'asevenishma. We will do and we will listen. Every generation confirms and reconfirms for itself. But not simply. Torah is old and must be made new again in each and every generation. Ten and twenty years ago, the buzzword of the UJA was continuity. That came with some criticism in the form of another good question. Continuity of what? Because continuity for the sake of continuity alone can be a static transfer. When Torah is meant to be dynamic, interpreted and applied anew in every era, the question everyone is asking and answering today is what's next? The buzzword of today is not so much continuity, although we're after that too. Instead, we use the word engagement. How will we engage with the coming generation? And how will the coming generation engage with Torah and mitzvot? In an interview with professor of an American Jewish history, Jonathan Sarna, there is a description of continuity and discontinuity. He explains, there is a generational disconnect between elders who grew up before the internet age and young people who grew up in a post-internet age. Those who are tethered to technology are literally on a different wavelength than earlier generations. They are in constant virtual touch with one another. They read a screen instead of a book. What does this mean for the people of the book? And they meet their friends on Facebook and other technology forms, social media, and so there's less of a need to meet in synagogue or at the JCC. Young Jews also do not understand the worldview of the so-called Jewish establishment. For Jews today in their 20s, in their 50s and 60s, like me, Sarna writes, the Six-Day War in 1967 shaped the way we think about Israel and about our responsibility as Jews. Likewise, the Soviet Jewry movement taught us to work together as Jews to help and save our brethren abroad. Young Jews today don't remember the Six-Day War. Instead, they came of age when Israel has become a much more controversial topic. He also points out the challenge to Jewish establishment. Sarna writes, today's young people are skeptical about anything establishment. They saw the ruin of 9-11 in 2001 and the economic collapse of 2008. They've seen too many institutions fall. 
So instead, they look at who is at the forefront of change. They see nimble startups and disruptive technologies. If you have an idea, they believe, you should carry it out right now. And they are not afraid of failure. They understand that in a startup culture, 90% fail and 10% succeed. They are not interested in continuity. The people they respect are agents of change, people like Steve Jobs, who were not afraid to break things. And Sarna, as a historian, points to the 1870s, when also then there were young people who knew how to think outside the box and who used the new innovations and technologies of their day, like the streetcar and the telephone. And they used those to inject new life into the Jewish community. And of course, there were philanthropists then, as thank God there are today, who supported them. Those teenagers and those in their 20s in the 1870s were the startup generation of their time. And they built for the 20th century Jewry. We are inheritors of those minds. Holy Blossom Temple, established in 1856, the first synagogue of Toronto. We are the beneficiaries of those innovators. This coming Rosh Hashanah will mark a 160th anniversary. Yes, older than Canada. What is the secret of our success? That healthy tension between honoring tradition, upholding it, respecting it, and always keeping an eye on modernity and the new demands and the new possibilities that could be for us. Holy Blossom Temple in this way is relevant decade after decade because of our curiosity of growing trends, the issues presented by the current moment, and our willingness to experiment, our readiness to invest in the future. Our grand facade on Bathurst Street here, stained glass and concrete, and those heavy oak wooden doors, people might see that beautiful facade with the ascent of stairs in a dramatic way, and they might make the mistake in believing that we are fixed in time. Not so. Our doors are not locked. Holy Blossom Temple has proven time and again in every generation to be surprisingly nimble and innovative, to adapt and to adjust again and again. And now is one of those times, exactly now. I hope you're hearing about changes on the way, good experiments, willingness to think boldly, even take some risks, I hope we don't fail in any one of these measured and thoughtfully uh, chosen innovations. And I hope that young people will look and see what we're after and want to be a part of it. I'll highlight just one today so that you can help to get the good word out, so that you can be our ambassadors. There's a bold agenda set by temple leadership today Last year, we were successful in offering a special membership for those in their 20s, students and young professionals. And this year, we are rolling out a new partnership for families with children age 8 and younger. It's called Truma, which means gift of the heart. We recognize the financial pressures for many young families today. Truma is a partnership. Truma is a covenant based on a self-assessed fair share contribution. We invite each young family to make a meaningful contribution, which only they can determine, knowing that the rest of the community will be there in covenantal relationship to help fill the gap that is needed. In this way, everyone is a giver and a receiver of the mitzvah. This is the power of community. This is the power of covenant, of standing together at Sinai. So if you know of friends or family, colleagues or neighbors who are looking for a synagogue to call home, please let us know so that we can reach out to them one by one, individually with a personal invitation. 
We take this commitment seriously. This is another way that we can strengthen the covenant of the Jewish people of Toronto, Lador Vador. Atem Nitzavim, I make this covenant not with you alone, but with those who are standing here together with us today before Adonai your God, as well as those who are not yet standing with us today. Our confirmation students, our bat mitzvah, today is a day of affirmation for you, of taking your place, your rightful place in this covenant. You are recipients of a wonderful inheritance, and we are proud of you, and we will continue to be there with you in a covenantal relationship that is lasting. And if you should ever feel lonely, I want you to know, because I understand that the teenage years can be a time of loneliness, when you stand at Sinai in this covenantal relationship with your people, you are never alone. There's a difference between feeling lonely and standing alone. You never stand alone. Giving and receiving Torah transcends time and space. To fulfill revelation, we depend on one another and we depend on you. Yes, when it comes to Torah, children do depend on parents and grandparents to receive it lovingly and with inspiration and passion. But it's also true, I want you to know, that parents receive Torah from you. And our generation today takes inspiration from you. We are building for you. Sinai was open in the wilderness. That's where we were bound together as a people and where God was also bound to us. So I'll conclude with one more word of Torah that you can take away with you for inspiration. Ki karov elecha hadavar me'od beficha uvilvavcha la'asoto. Surely this mitzvah which I enjoin you this day, this Torah that you receive this day is not too baffling for you, nor is it beyond your reach. This covenant is very close to you. It is in your mouth and it is in your heart so that you can do it. Can you hear that song? May it be God's will.